You thought your property taxes were bad? At least you aren't arguing your house is overvalued by $300 million, like one hotel. Denver Mayor Mike Johnston met some obstacles on the road to get 1,000 people off the street by year's end. With two days to go, he says the city is in good shape to get there. Two years after the Marshall Fire, scientists are still studying how two fires became one and who may be at fault for billions of dollars in damages. And we end the week and the year on a high note. My good news is I had my first child this year and she's happy, healthy, and beautiful. Let's celebrate a year's worth of your good news tonight on Next. Of all the hundreds of thousands of people who appealed their property values this year, it took us until December 29th to find perhaps the most egregious. For many, many property owners, the fight was to lower the property tax bill, maybe a few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand or so. There is one property owner that believes their assessed value is too high. $270 million too high. Marshall Zellinger, I feel like Ron Burgundy here reading the teleprompter yeah. saying $270 million. No, that, that's not a typo. That is real. No, I, I wrote it correctly, yeah. Maybe someone out there thought that their home was appraised for $270,000 too much. Maybe $27,000. But $270 million? That's the argument being made by the Gaylord Hotel in Aurora. Adams County has valued the Gaylord Hotel property at $744 million. Gaylord went through the same process you or I could to appeal the assessed value. First, an appeal to the county assessor. The assessor did not budge. Then, Gaylord took the next step any of us could have and appealed to the County Board of Equalization. Again, Gaylord was denied a change of value. And now the resort took the challenge to district court, where they are asking a judge to lower the assessed value from $744 million to $475 million. Gaylord argues that the county has taken into account value that should not be added in, like income from food and beverage sales, spa service sales, and gift shop income. In 2019, Gaylord wanted its property assessment lowered $400 million and ultimately lost. Gaylord is not alone in this process. In Adams County, 18,000 property owners appealed their value to the assessor. Almost 4,000 saw the value drop, but 14,000 were denied. 3,300 of those took the next step at the Board of Equalization. 675 won a lower value. Almost 2,000 were denied. 10 are now in district court, including Gaylord. District court is actually one of three options, because now the arrows go like this way to three. Uh, property owners can, can do one of three things. The majority, almost 400, are seeking another board of appeals option. Six have gone straight to arbitration, and as I said there, 10 chose to go the court path. Everybody watching at home who's gotten their own property values increased over the past year, they're like, yeah, you go, Gaylord. <laughs> sure, but like $270 million. They had a similar argument four years ago. It finally got resolved last year, and they lost, and then they had to cut a check for $67 million to Adams County after fighting it for three years. So they're taking it back to court again. I, I don't know if the, how nuanced the argument is different or not, but we'll follow it this time because now we're way in tune with what this means. The $700 million Gaylord Hotel, just like the rest of us. Sure, Marshall, yeah. thank you. The city of Denver is poised to meet its goal of moving 1,000 people into housing by the end of this year. That's a major accomplishment. But now, perhaps, comes the even harder part. As the city commits to paying for people who live in hotels indefinitely, moving people into permanent housing will take time and a whole lot of money. No one should be homeless in Denver. We have a moral obligation to make sure we can get people off the streets and into housing. What started out as a and campaign promise in February became reality in September. This is the first time in four years that I've ever been approached um, with this opportunity. The city called it decommissioning an encampment, a far different approach than what we'd grown used to seeing in Denver. On the corner of 8th and Logan, the city offered housing for the first time to people living in tents. I feel like I can breathe right now. <laughs> so, it's really cool. What they're doing is really cool, how they came out and um, it's kind of like in your face, you know, it's like, let's go. Mayor Mike Johnston's plan cost an estimated $50 million in the 2023 budget. It came with anger at community meetings as neighbors pushed back on proposed micro communities in their areas. Would this happen in Cherry Creek? Would this happen in Washington Park? No, it would not. Today, nearly 900 people have been moved off the streets. This weekend, the city says the number will hit 1,000. Less than a third have been moved into permanent housing. You can't put into words something that's so dramatically different 
it was just, oh, I don't believe this is really, how can this be real, pinch yourself kind of thing. As a growing number of migrants arriving in Denver now require a dwindling number of resources, two crises collide. A new year brings new challenges. Even if we succeed at getting a thousand into housing, that won't be the end. That's not the, that's not mission accomplished. We still have more people to serve and more work to do in the next year. But this is a really ambitious goal that no city has taken on and delivered, and we want to stay out to, to succeed. The city has changed how it counts people who are housed over the past six months. Now they count someone as housed as soon as they move into a shelter. That's a change from the original metric of waiting 14 days to see if they are still in housing at that point. At this point, the city says 98% of people who've moved into those shelters are still housed today. This is the time of the year when the state likes to shake things up a little bit, keep us on our toes. All those new laws that we've been talking about all year long go into effect next week. That means Coloradans will be able to reap the benefits of the state's new paid family leave program. It's a program years in the making, and we will have spent the past year paying for it. The Family Act passed back in 2020. The state has spent the last few years creating the system, which is now designed to help people who need to take up to 12 weeks of paid leave for things like a birth or taking care of a sick family member. Most Coloradans are eligible as long as they earned over $25,000, $2,500 last year. Even people who are self-employed or people whose employers opted out of the program can still participate, but they have to cover their own premiums. Employers and employees who didn't opt out of the program have spent the past year funding the program through payroll deductions. Last January 1st, uh, most Colorado workers began paying into this program. So this isn't a handout. This is something we've all been paying for as insurance over the last year. And now, beginning January 1, we'll be able to take advantage of that benefit. And after all that waiting, the program's off to a busy start. The state's Division of Family and Medical Leave Insurance says nearly 5,000 claims have already been filed ahead of the January 1st rollout. Well, tomorrow marks two years since the most destructive wildfire in Colorado history burned through Boulder County. Two people lost their lives and more than 1,000 homes were destroyed. At the two-year mark, the recovery is still a work in progress. In the town of Louisville, where more than 550 structures were destroyed, about 40% of families have been issued a permit to rebuild. Even less, about a quarter of residents who lost their homes have been clear bet to move back in. Recovery is a bit further along in Superior, where almost uh, where those homes were destroyed. Town officials say they've issued rebuilding permits for 70% of the homes that were destroyed in Superior. 157 families have been moved in to move back in there. And as recovery continues, so does the battle to find accountability. Dozens of families and even local governments have filed lawsuits against Excel Energy, seeking to recover some of the estimated $2 billion in damages caused by the Marshall Fire. Investigators say an Excel power line was likely to blame as the source of the second fire, second of two fires, that merged together on December 30th, 2021. Excel says it didn't start the fire, its equipment didn't start that fire, and that the other fire all did all the damage. Scientists are still working to answer some of those questions through computer models. Through computer models, meteorologist Corey Repenhagen walks us through one of those recreations from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. In a very unusual circumstance, there were two separate fire ignitions less than an hour apart that led to the Marshall Fire on December 30th, 2021. The first fire, which is officially known as the El Dorado Springs Fire, started on the 12 tribes property about 40 minutes before a spark from a power line started what's officially known as the Trailhead Fire. The two fires merged and became the Marshall Fire. You know, people want to understand what happened and I guess to some extent attribute uh, blame. NCAR scientist Janice Cohen recreated the scenario using a fire behavior computer model. The Coupled Atmosphere Wildland Fire Environment, or COFFEE model, separated the impacts of each fire even though the ignitions were less than a half mile apart. The simulation showed that the first fire, the one that started on the 12 tribes property, not only had a 40 minute head start, but it also was surrounded by stronger winds. It cut in front of the second fire. The trailhead fire, that is the fire that was deemed to have been started by Excel, shortly ran into 
the back end of the previously burned area, what we would call the black. The result of the recreation showed that the 12 tribes fire was responsible for more than half of the total burned area. Cohen then ran the simulation without the 12 tribes ignition to see if the Marshall fire would have been just as catastrophic without it. Mm. So the trailhead fire would have stopped short of McCaslin at approximately Highway 36, so it wouldn't have caused nearly the damage had it occurred on its own. She said by itself the fire started by the power lines would have burned 40% less area, resulting in significantly less burned structures. It would have also traveled slower, which may have given firefighters a better chance to stop it even sooner. Meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen, 9 News. There was also a third fire that day that isn't talked about as much. It's called the Middle Fork Fire. It was just north of Boulder. The NCAR computer model showed that fire could have actually been even more damaging than the Marshall Fire if firefighters had not quit, put it out quickly. That fire could have destroyed part of the heavily populated city of Longmont. We want to take a moment to say a quick thank you to all of you for all that you've done over the past week to help fund grief support services to families missing a loved one this holiday season. Kyle's on the road in a quiet little corner of New York with an update on this week's Word of Things. Thanks for being with Next while I'm away. We've talked a bit this holiday season about how grief weighs heavy on a lot of people this time of year. But there are also wonderful folks in our community who walk with Coloradans who are grieving. That's why this week's Word of Thanks campaign supports the Community Grief Center serving Northern Colorado. All of their services are free. Their services for kids who have lost a parent or a sibling. Their services for spouses who have lost a loved one and other folks in our community who are feeling weighed down and exhausted by grieving. And we can support their efforts to expand their work in the community. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get the link to join me in giving. We also have our new way to simplify your giving through a monthly gift to the Word of Thanks Fund. Use the same QR code or text to get there. Community Grief Center is intent to make sure that no one goes through this process alone or is financially burdened by it, and we can help. XL customers are being bombarded with offers to save bid on solar. But is it too good to be true? We'll take a closer look at the numbers and who's really behind the offers. And we'll ring in the new year with a look back at all the good things that happened in your lives this year. Our favorite Friday tradition, next. Our next question is a bit of an evergreen question, since it's something that we've heard throughout the year. I guess it's fitting, though, that it comes from a viewer in Evergreen. Daryl. Hey, next. I received this offer from Excel if I would enroll in a solar sun farm that I would be able to get my rate reduced every month. Is this for real? So Daryl is far from alone in questioning those mailers. We also heard from Laura in Loveland, Mike in Lakewood, a bunch of you. Even more when Marshall first reported on this offer a couple months ago. They are not mailers from Excel, even though Excel's name shows up on them seven times. They come from a Maryland company called Neighborhood Sun, which is trying to sign up customers for a community solar project. They call it a solar farm. For customers who sign up, since you're not buying or renting these solar panels, Neighborhood Sun gets the bulk of the solar credit, 90% of it. So let's break it out in an example. If your electric bill was $150 and you got $100 worth of solar credit, you would owe Excel 50 bucks. But you don't get to keep the full solar credit. Of the $100 in solar credit that you get, you pay $90 back to Neighborhood Sun and you benefit $10. Neighborhood Sun told us this week 150,000 mailers went out to try and get just 2,500 people to sign up. When we reported on it in June, 170,000 mailers had just been sent out and 2,000 ended up signing up. I want to introduce you to a new face that you might be seeing here for the next couple of days. Meteorologist Carl Lamb is visiting from our partner station in Cleveland, helping us out while our nine news meteorologists juggle some time off during the holidays. Carl, you are in luck. It has just been snowing, and then you show up, and it's, it's actually pretty nice outside right now. It is super comfortable, and, you know, even as we go into tomorrow, we're going to have another duplicate day because we don't have any clouds across 
The urban corridor up towards high country still very calm and very pleasant. But here's future cast. Let's show you it's comfortable tonight. Temperatures will get a chance to drop though with a clear sky. High country, you'll see some of those clouds building in and western slope areas. That's where you'll have the clouds on Saturday. Denver out at the airport clear everyone around from Pueblo up towards areas like uh, Greeley. You've got beautiful conditions, but the clouds do move in Saturday night. They'll stick with us through Sunday. So the game on Sunday will feature mainly cloudy conditions, also some mountain snow as well. So let's show you that seven day forecast. Well, very comfortable for Saturday with temperatures in the low 50s for Sunday. Clouds roll in New Year's Day. We start with temperatures in the mid 40s and we'll have plenty of sunshine, but then temperatures just kind of hover right around the mid 40s. So really, really comfortable and pretty much right on target with where we should be for this time of year. We'll send it back to you, Mark. I feel like 2023 was really good. Um, got to meet the love of my life. After a year full of ups and downs, let's celebrate the ups with our favorite Friday question. What's your good news? That's next. For the past 362 Fridays, yes, we keep track. You have helped us end every week on a high note by sharing your good news with us, no matter how big or small. We've got a lot more good to look forward to in 2024. But today, let's take a moment to reflect back on that good news that got us to December 29th of 2023. Uh, it's a wonderful place. It's got a wonderful acoustic, uh, beautiful red rocks around you and cool people just checking out and passing through, listening and having a good day of it. My good news of 2023 is that we're getting married. My good news of 2023 is actually great news and I welcome my first baby, my daughter, into the world. So can't complain at all about that. Her good news would probably be that she got to be on this trip and, you know, be with her mom the entire time. My good news of 2023 is I graduated college. My good news is I became happy and my life changed and I thought I was gonna be just distraught. And now I'm the happiest I've ever been because of him and it's tremendous. Like we do everything together. The best news I got of 2023, I'd have to say honestly, is her. You know, we started a new family together and, and it's just, you know, been tremendous. It makes me really happy. 2023 was a good year. Got out on the river and hung out with friends and family and yeah, celebrated the birth of our daughter as well. My good news of 2023 is that I got my master's degree in social work and also my license in social work. I feel like 2023 was really good. Um, got to meet the love of my life. There's some good in everything, especially when you're at Red Rocks. We're back with some personal feedback on a story close to my heart, next. It is a sign that if you don't like Taylor Swift, you are wrong. If you didn't think Taylor Swift was everywhere, think again. A viewer sent this over, saw it at a bookstore. It's a magazine for every interest. That's what it says. If that interest happens to be Taylor Swift, they're all Taylor Swift magazines. If you see a sign that gets you stuck in your head, email us at nine, next at nine news.com or use the hashtag hey next quick note from me to you on this final show of 2023 i want to take a moment to say thank you for all your notes after my story about my dad leaving tv news after 36 years here in denver my family read hundreds of messages and comments and emails that you guys sent and we appreciated them all we were at dinner last night and a man came up to me and my dad and my wife at the restaurant. He said he had seen the story, told my dad, thank you for all the impacts that he's had on Colorado. It was one of the coolest experiences that I've had in this career. Pretty cool to see. It's hard to share personal stories sometimes with an audience of strangers watching at home. Moments like that remind me that we all have more in common and that we can all share more than we might have, might perhaps think. So thank you for caring about something cool that I wanted to share with all of you. See you next year.